Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for turning out for this lecture. And in view of the subject of the lecture, it's ironic that I have to introduce myself because Gresham College um, officials are not able to be present. Now, in terms of what I'm about to talk to you about, if I say I'm Jane Kaplan, you can, in fact, um, uh, request some further proof, some further identification, OK? Um, there will be, I think some of my slides may have my name on it. But anyway, that's who I am. I'm Jane Kaplan. I've just retired from teaching at the University of Oxford. Um, and I also have a position at um, Birkbeck in, in London. Oh, can you, sorry, this, I beg your pardon. Let me just see if I can hoik this up. Is that already better? I think I'm going to have to button myself in. Well, I don't like to do that, although to be honest, let me just see if I can't put this a bit higher up. Okay, how's that? Is that better? Okay, well, you can either see my face or you can hear me, so I expect you'd rather hear me than see my face. Um, <laughs> This is the title of my lecture series and of my first lecture. And I'm just going to move to the titles of the subsections so that you can know what you're in for. OK, so you may know who you are, but how do I know that you really are who you say you are? How, how are you going to prove to me I might be a sceptical stranger or perhaps um, a suspicious official at the, at the frontier or whatever? How are you going to persuade me that you are telling me the truth? How, in other words, can you be identified as an individual, and how are you going to prove this identity? The answer to these questions has a long history. I think they're particularly burning at the moment. We really don't see very many weeks go past without finding um, some kind of item in the newspapers about identity, the protection of identity from identity theft, and so on. But there's a much older history, which I think is less well understood, and that history is the subject of my series of lectures. I hope to persuade you that learning what identification meant and how it was recorded in the past will give you a better understanding of what it means in the present. Now, let me assure you that I'm not going to give you a history of the passport, uh, even if some of us think that would be quite interesting enough on its own, but it would be a rather dry subject, I think. I'm not going to do that. In fact, I'm not talking about the identity document as a finished thing. I'm going to be talking about your name, your signature and your tattoos, if you have them, and how they figured in the history of ID. Um, let me just do a reality check. Can you now hear me OK? OK, I'm going to bellow in that case. So people <laughs> in the front row, you have been warned. In the early 19th century, Jeremy Bentham formulated the fundamental question of identification as this. Who are you with whom I have to deal? In other words, Proving who you are is an active process of identification. It's not a subjective state. It's a transaction between at least two parties. If that identification is not based on immediate recognition deriving from existing acquaintance, I know there are some people in this audience who know who I am because I know them already, OK? The rest of you are going to have to take this on trust. Um, so if it's not based on um, existing acquaintance, it's going to require some kind of reliable proof that is external to your own protestations. This proof, as one scholar has put it, and I quote, will be a sign which stands for the authentic object and that object only. The classical example of this kind of sign or token is the scar on the leg of Odysseus. Now, if you remember the story, the returning wanderer wants to remain anonymous to his wife Penelope and his countrymen who don't recognise him when he turns up. They don't know that this is Odysseus. His identity is first involuntarily betrayed to his old nurse Eurycleia, who we see here washing his feet, um, by a scar that was left after Odysseus was gored by a boar in his youth, which she recognises when she's washing the stranger's feet. The scar, in other words, stands as the sign of Odysseus's identity and produces a kind of, has a, a proving value, which is higher than anything that Odysseus could say or not say. And in fact, Odysseus has to show the same scar, the same mark, to convince his doubting father Laertes that he really is the son who had gone missing for 20 years. So Odysseus cannot be the author of his recognition and identification by others. This, wor this work of identification, this work of recognition, has to be done by a mark or token that other people interpret. <coughs> 
Um, you're unlikely to find yourself in this situation. Nowadays, we don't generally rely on scars to affirm who we are, although I'll suggest in a later lecture that there are situations when a scar could be brought into play. In the contemporary world, as we all know, we delegate the work of recognition and verification to a different kind of token, but it is a token, and that token is a document of one kind or another. This is what we're all familiar with today. The most familiar of these are documents issued by the state. Increasingly, they're not just paper documents, but smart cards and electronic technologies. In almost all countries in the world, including most of the European Union, some kind of governmentally mandated identity card is now the standardised and compulsory means of proving your identity. Britain is one of the few exceptions. We don't have ID cards. We have had them in the past, as I'll explain, but we do not have an ID card as such. But it isn't just the state that's interested in our identifiability. Commercial enterprises, such as banks and retailers, have for, for at least a century, two centuries, been interested in verifying the identity of their customers and clients. And in fact, they've recently, these commercial movers, if you like, have become one of the major engines of identification in the contemporary world, um, and have recently moved, I think, in advance of states. I'll come back to that in a moment. And of course, we ourselves need to be identifiable because we live in a society where a whole series of entitlements are contingent on proving your eligibility for them. You need to show who you are if you want to claim um, certain performances by the state. So here's a composite of identity documents that I'll talk about in a second. Where there is no compulsory identity card, many different documents are liable to be pressed into service for the purposes of identification. The result is a patchwork of papers that we can be asked to proffer on different occasions. In the United States of America, where I lived for many years, the driver's license functions as a de facto ID document. There isn't an ID card as such, but the driver's license, which of course not everybody has, but many, many people do, functions as your ID. In other countries, eligible documents that get pressed into service as proof of identity include a passport, a firearms license, um, there you have it in New Zealand, um, and these are um, officially acceptable, okay? So this is not just any old thing. These are, if you look at the list of documents you can produce to prove your identity, in New Zealand it will include your firearms license, in India uh, a ration card, there are a couple here, a national age card in Ireland, and an age card of course is to prove your minimum age for the right to buy alcohol. Here in the UK, you can use your passports, your passport or your driver's license as a photo ID, and I'm sure you've all done this. I mean, none of this is news to you. But you'll also know that if you want to pick up your mail at the post office, or for that matter, renew your British Library Reader's Card, you'll also need to bring along a recent utility bill or a council tax receipt to prove your address. Those of us with long memories will remember a more primitive version of this, or at least I recall my mother using this in the 1950s. She used to carry an old envelope in her handbag to present as a proof of her name and address when she was paying by cheque. This was before the introduction of the cheque guarantee card. Actually, to confuse the question of identity, Mrs. Alexander is not my mother. <laughs> but, uh, but I wanted an envelope with a sufficiently old postmark on it that um, it would uh, make my point. At the other extreme, I mean, this is, you know, the idea that this would be sufficient to pass a cheque these days is laughable, okay? And in fact, as I've said, if I wanted to renew my British Library card, I couldn't just bring an envelope addressed to me. I have to have something issued by some other authority, so a council tax bill or a utility bill. But at the other extreme, when I went to renew my, um, or wanted to renew my, my swimming pool membership at my local pool in Oxford um, a few weeks ago, at the pensioners' reduced rate, I was told on the website, which I researched in advance, that I'd need to dig out my passport to present as proof of my age. And that seemed to me to be rather excessive, that I just wanted to swim every morning, to have to bring my passport along, as if I was some, somehow, at least to, to get the card initially, as if I was crossing some international frontier that ran down the middle of Marlborough Road and Hinksey Park. Anyway, in the event I wasn't asked for my passport, because one look at my face, unfortunately, was enough to <laughs> assure the pool attendant that I was over 60. 
Now, let me take the passport example a little further. We may treat it as the gold standard of identification, but in the eyes of the Home Office, the passport is a travel document, not an identity document. This was confirmed in an article that happened to appear in The Guardian on the 14th of May while I was writing this lecture. And I have to say that uh, you know, the, the virtue of working on this subject is that you know, every day you read something in the paper and you think, oh, that'll look good, this'll be helpful, this'll, you know, this'll underline what I'm saying. Anyway, this Guardian article concerned Helen Perry, a mother returning to Britain from a trip abroad with her children. She was asked by the immigration officer for proof that her children were really hers, because after a divorce and a remarriage, her surname was different from theirs, as shown on their passports. And perhaps there are people here who've had that experience too. Uh, if you have, then you'll be interested to know that Perry uh, founded an organisation to lobby for a redesigned child's passport that will include the identification of a child's parents or legal guardians as part of it. Now, the Home Office, their objection to redesigning the passport in this way, were grounded in the argument that, as they said um, in response to her request, quote, the passport is a document for travel. Its fundamental purpose would change if it were to be used to identify a parental relationship. Perry's response was, well, everybody uses their passport to prove who they are. Well, both Perry and the Home Office are correct in what they claimed, but of course the claims are... Um, in, they don't meet each other because they're on two different terrains. Um, these examples suggest several things about identification and its documentation that I'll be exploring or alluding to in, in this series. First, the fact that you have an identity is not identical with an act of identification. Okay, you have to hold on to your hats here because there's quite a lot of sort of conceptual stuff coming, but it, 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 it won't tax the brains of people here, I feel certain. Um, Second, recognition and identification are the outcome of a balance between proof and trust. I think the element of trust is always present at, 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 um, at some point because, because ultimate proof is impossible. Thirdly, the obligation to be, to be identifiable is, or at least it ought to be, balanced by a right to be identifiable. And concomitantly, in some other circumstances, um, by a right to anonymity or privacy and, again, straight from the headlines, all this fuss about Google and the question of whether you have the right to remove data about yourself from the Google sites is tied into this question of anonymity and privacy. Fourth, there's a difference between generic and targeted ID. In other words, you know, um, my, my passport, let's say, or an identity card, and my store loyalty card. The store loyalty card is just targeted at me when I go to Sainsbury's and want to collect my nectar points. Um, uh, fifthly, Providing and proving the proof and then underwriting the proof of the proof and so on is, in principle, an infinitely receding goal. And, you know, some of the uh, history of identification procedures is the attempt to achieve this holy grail. Would it be the fingerprint? Would it be DNA? Would it be iris recognition? Uh, would it be, you know, a range of other things which um, I'll come back to probably at various points in the lectures. Finally, and this is really my point as a historian... The repertoire of the criteria and mechanisms for identification will depend heavily on historical and local circumstances. Some aspects of older regimes will be superseded, but contemporary systems will also conserve traces of these older practices of recognition and uh, verification. I think one of them, um, which I'll just interpolate here, is that if you think about when you um, go to get your passport application signed, you have to have it signed by not just some person who knows you, okay, even if not a relative of yours, but somebody who is on a who is a professional person, a person of standing. Okay, I think I may come back that to come come back to that in a moment. But that is a residue of a very old system called the recommender system, which has its roots back in, well, certainly in the 19th century, but, um, but earlier too, if we're thinking about communal forms of identification. So there's nothing um, that's natural or given about the identity that is attested in identity documents. It's an artificial and composite relationship um, with its own history, and that's my subject here. Today, for the rest of this lecture, I'm going to be exploring the relationship between identity and identification because I want to tease out and present to you the difference between who we are subjectively and who we are to others objectively. I know I'm Jane Kaplan, I've presented myself to you as Jane Kaplan, but there's a difference between my subjective sense of myself um, and your objective knowledge of me. Um, so I'll start by introducing the history of modern regimes of identification in this country, 
and then questioning some, some of our common assumptions about the history of identification um, in the past. For example, there's an old um, supposition that people were not very mobile in the past and therefore, and also less literate, and therefore they didn't carry forms of ID. Um, another one which I think needs thinking about, um, which I mentioned earlier on just a moment ago, is that it's the state that really primarily drives the push for ID rather than um, uh, commercial companies. And as I've said, in the lectures that follow, I'm not going to kind of, I'm going to unpack the identity document. That's my purpose. I'm going to go a step back from the identity document to see how some of the elements that participate in the construction of identity on paper have been selected and stabilised and made available, if you like, for that act of, of, um, of identification. Let me say a bit more about what I mean by this. Um, this slide shows you the description page from a British passport with detailed entries under name, physical description, special peculiarities, and so on. Okay, Here, chin, nose, forehead, eyes, mouth, colour of hair, complexion, face, any special peculiarities. Okay, Who would be willing to admit to that? Um, now, they look pretty neutral on the page, but this neat list of of characterizations is deceptive, or at least it's in historical denial. And the fact, of course, that you laughed at it is evidence of that. This is not a contemporary passport, OK? Um, this passport was issued in 1920, a few years after passports had become compulsory for international travel. Um, it includes standardized data. I mean, this is the point at which passports are being standardized. And the first list of things, which is actually in my um, understanding, drawn from descriptions of criminals or wanted convicts that would be circulated by police. So all these things, forehead, nose, etc., come straight from the criminal fiche. Um, and some aspects of that, as we'll see in a second, were objectionable con to contemporaries. It also includes information, as I've just said, which um, is now either absent from today's passports or is encoded in an electronic format Okay, that we cannot read. This is my passport, and that's the crucial part of it, right? Okay, that little thing there, which I can't read, expropriates from me all the information that you've just seen. Okay, at least I could verify whether I had a regular nose, right? Um, but who knows what kind of a nose I have in that little chip. So I wonder what I'm going to do in the lectures is, is really restore history to this changing end product. Okay, and as I've said, I'm going to be looking successively at the name, the signature, and the special peculiarity or distinctive mark of the tattoo. In those lectures, I'm going to kind of range rather eclectically over France, Germany, and England, but today I want to start in England. Um, and I've got a couple of pages here of, of mind-busting stuff, so as I say, hold on to your hats and prepare to think. Um, in English, the concept of identity in its contemporary sense emerged in the 16th or 17th century, around that time, where it generated a double meaning that has attached to it ever since. You'll notice I'm slowing down, OK, so that I can make sure this is fixed. First of all, identity connotes the sameness of one entity with another. These sheets of paper that I'm holding, at least for this purpose, are identical. These rows of chairs you're sitting on um, are all chairs. Okay, But there's a second meaning of identity, which is self-sameness. Okay? The capacity of an entity to be stably and continuously itself. Now, this is not as simple as it may seem, at least as far as human beings are concerned. Maybe a chair remains a chair. I mean, there are varieties of chair, but these chairs are not... They are, for, to all intents and purposes, they remain what they are. But from the days of Locke and Hume in the, in the 17th and 18th centuries, philosophers, and after them social scientists and psychologists, have pondered the question of how a changing human personality, which subsists and changes over time, can be said to be one and the same person over time and in different contexts. I mean, just think about it. In what ways are you exactly the same person now that you were yesterday or 10 years ago or who you will be in 10 years' time? Okay? And if, as um, John Locke suggested, it's persisting self-consciousness that constitutes identity, okay, we carry our consciousness through in our life, well, wait a minute, think whether you're the same person continuously when you're asleep, unconscious, and dreaming, and possibly producing thoughts and images which you would be embarrassed to 
generate in your waking mind. And actually, that issue of the relationship of the unconscious mind and the dream to the stable human personality was very, very important in the developing psychology of, of personhood in the 17th and 18th century. OK, my subject is not psychology or philosophy, so I'm not going to wrestle with these um, questions, although they could divert us for days. But I want to remind us, I'm using them, to remind us that human identity is not unitary, it's not an inherent essence. On the contrary, it's unstable, it's ambiguous, and it's in dynamic relationship with the world around us. It's an attribution that is freighted, if you like, with subjective and objective uncertainty. I mean, I hope you'll all leave this hall knowing who you are, but perhaps you'll have a sense that the question of knowing who you are is a little more complicated than you came in to the hall with. Um, identity is something that depends as much on other people as on ourselves. It depends on difference as much as sameness. It depends on the groups and categories that we are part of as much as on the process of individuation, of our individuality. But if you think about it, this, this is a fragile concept, OK? But it's also locked into, it's soldered to absolutely fundamental enlightenment values that are the bedrock of our culture. Uh, our notions of selfhood, our notions of individuality and subjectivity, on the one hand. I mean, this is, they, these are so important in, in contemporary Western culture that we think of ourselves as self-sufficient individuals, the authors of our actions, responsible for ourselves, so on and so forth. Um, and on the other hand, as well as that um, uh, extraordinary importance of the idea of the individual, the idea of the human subject in post-Enlightenment um, European thought, I'm, and I'm talking about Europe, this is not to exclude other cultures, but um, that these processes are different in different parts of the world. Um, the other aspect of it in our culture is that we're strongly committed to objectivity and to categorization, and also to understanding social relations, the construction of society, as the sum of relations between individuals. Well, that's not the only way you could describe it, okay? There are critiques of that, but it's a good enough um, definition for our purposes. Um, the French historian Beatrice Frankel, who I'll be referring to later in this series, nailed this, in, this essential incoherence of identity when she wrote the following, quote, identity is at the same time that which distinguishes an individual from others and that which assimilates him to others. OK, you're all individuals, but you're all humans. Or for this purpose, you're all my audience, right? In other words, asking the question, who are you, merges imperceptibly into the question, what kind of a person are you? What category of personhood do you belong to? So let me explain what all this has to do with identification and identity in terms of the identity document. If, as I've argued, identity is not a given or stable attribute, an effective regime of individual identification will depend on, on the existence or on the extraction and on the isolation and stabilization of certain markers of personal identity or self-sameness. And if you like, that's all I mean. That's just a fancy way of saying there are those categories. These terms have been extracted to be, the, to be markers of individuation. Um, It'll need to do this for two purposes for the identity document, OK? One is to achieve the correspondence between the person and the subjective claim. I am who I claim to be. The bearer of this passport is the person who um, is allegedly the subject of this passport, OK? The other is to ensure the correspondence between that person and that set of signs encoded in the document. So you, you, you have to have a set of signs that will um, underwrite your claim to be who you claim to be. And the other one is that this document corresponds to this, this set of signs. So your identity document um, has to, has to you, there has to be both the validity of you as the subject who applied to the identity document, and then the identity document itself has to be um, a fair record of who you are. I think there's always going to be, you know, kind of a play or a tension um, between subjective identity and objective identification. But it's that second form, the signs that produce identification. I refer you again to my grandparents' passport. That's my primary subject. I mean, let me illustrate this with a, um, another example. We hear a lot about identity theft today, right? But if my identity is stolen, the thief doesn't care who I really am, OK? It's the signs that are misappropriated. OK, my signature, my 
bank account number, that kind of thing. It's not my subjective identity. They don't give a toss about that. In fact, if they did, they might think twice before stealing us. <laughs> so, um, and in fact, of course, if you think about it, I've talked about you know, there being a tension between a subjective and objective identification. Well, another way of illustrating that is to think about the fact that um, even if the mechanics of identification may conform to our sense of self at times, they're also quite likely to be inconsistent with our own self-perception. Um, now, let me get somewhere where I can look. Hands up anybody in this room who thinks that their passport photo captures their essence and is a wonderful <laughs> portrait of who they are. Okay. Um, the French philosopher Michel Foucault, and I'm afraid in this kind of lecture you cannot get away without some reference to Foucault, um, conveyed this sense that there is a tension between identity and identification in a characteristically ironic comment, which for once was not as Delphic as some of his ironic comments were. He said, or wrote once, do not ask who I am and do not ask me to remain the same. Leave that to our bureaucrats and our police to see that our papers are in order. And that, in a sense, sums up what I've just been saying to you. Now, Foucault's intimation that official paper uh, constitutes and even usurps our real existential identity became a common theme in the era after the First World War um, when citizens of many European countries found themselves faced with demands for identity documents for the first time. Um, most often this was the passport or some other travel document. Um, the war had brought to an end the 19th century era of relatively free or relatively passport-free travel. I mean, there's a, a lot of ways in which... I mean, it's, it, it's often said that the late 19th century, sort of post-1860, was the era of the freest forms of travel across Europe. Well, for some people, yes, OK, but... But, um, but not for many ordinary people who could not cross borders or even travel in their own country without some kind of um, labour certificate of some kind. But anyway, this theme became very prominent in public discourse in the period after the First World War. And I would say not exactly for the first time. I mean, other issues of identification we can find um, are shot through novels of the 19th century. Just think of Wilkie Collins, for example. But um, this chap... Um, B. Traven was the pen name of a, a seaman, a German seaman and a radical, and this is perhaps his best-known novel. And he wrote in this, uh, and I'm going to quote, it seems to me that the sailor's card and not the sun is the centre of the universe. I am positive that the Great War was fought not for democracy and justice, but for no other reason than that a cop or an immigration officer may have the legal right to ask you and be well paid for asking you, to show him his sailor's card or whatever. Before the war, nobody asked you for your passport. In a more whimsical illustration of this clash between the claims of subjective self-perception and the requirements of objective classification, let me cite a letter to the Times written by one Bassett Digby of Half Moon Street, Mayfair, when he applied for his first passport in 1915. This is a letter that he then wrote to the Times in February 1915. This is the year that passports became compulsory in, for British subjects to travel. Digby pointed to what he called the high-handed methods of the passports department at the Foreign Office and went on, on the form provided for this purpose, I described my face as intelligent. <laughs> Instead of finding this characterization entered, I have received a passport on which some official utterly unknown to me, a double irony, has taken it upon himself to call my face oval. <laughs> and in fact, you probably saw that that was a, a common description. In other words, the faceless bureaucrat meets full-face citizen. Um, 1915, the year where the passport is introduced, was also the year that saw the uh, introduction of a compulsory system of national registration um, into Britain, which was intended to monitor military manpower, and that's obviously because Britain did not have a conscription, a well-oiled conscription system as, say, Germany did. This first regime of uh, national registration was also linked to an identity card, which embraced not only men of military age, but also everyone aged 15 to 65, so it was also about manpower control. Okay, this is an early, these are the 19, the, the First World War cards. Okay. Now, the fate of this card was the opposite of the passport. Despite bureaucratic efforts to make the scheme permanent, I mean, once they've got a tool like this, they do not want to get rid of it. 
Um, the Accard remained unpopular, and it fell into disuse after the war. Of course, that was unlike the passport, which has uh, governed international travel uh, ever since, okay, despite great efforts made by the League of Nations immediately after the First World War to try to abolish the passport. Predictably, of course, in Britain, an identity card system and a registration system was reintroduced in 1939 um, with the uh, outbreak of the Second World War and a new machinery of registration and identity cards, which, uh, in fact, bore remarkable similarities to these. You have a sense of the other stash of them, or at least that they kept an idea of you know, what it should look like. Um, this scheme was abandoned in its turn in 1952, you know, pretty late on, and that was partly because uh, many bureaucrats wanted to turn it into a permanent scheme, okay, and it was only overturned as a result of a very important court case um, involving um, somebody objecting to a police officer asking him for his ID card. Um, but it was satirised, the identity card system and the whole kind of structure of identification in Britain was satirised in a, an entertaining Although, well, actually, I'm going to say it's this novel. Am I right in saying it's largely forgotten? Have people here read it? Yes. Yeah, OK, so good. All righty, there you go. So, published in 1955. Now, the plot, as you may remember, it's very, very arcane and convoluted. It turns on the proposition that, quote, modern man is so unsure of who he is that any charlatan can impose a false identity upon him. In the novel, this proposition that you can just simply be foisted with a new identity... It's tested by members of this mysterious group called the Identity Club that has taken it upon itself to manufacture and impose new identities on their luckless experimental subjects. They are fortified in this by access to the wartime apparatus of ration books and identity cards, and that's what makes their game possible. Their spokesman tells one of their targets, um, the charwoman, Mrs Chirk, and we'll meet her again in these lectures, this is what the captain tells her. You must try and understand that the old days are over, the days when you could take your identity for granted. Nowadays, all the old means of self-recognition have been swept away, leaving even the best people in a state of personal dubiety. Very wisely, governments all over the world have sought to stop this, stop this rot before the entire human population has been reduced to anonymous grains. End of quote. I mean, that's a sort of interesting proposition because, of course, in some ways, it's the existence of this kind of card which standardises us all onto this piece of paper, which seems to be the anonymization process, but not in Dennis's book. So in the fantasy produced by Nigel Dennis, an external authority imperiously takes over the power, not only to issue the documents that prove identity, but to tell you who you are at the deepest existential level. Again, to illustrate how this might operate, the mechanics of this, there's a case reported by a French sociologist in the 1990s which illuminates from the other side of the equation, if you like, the merger of identity and paper. Um, this colleague of mine, Claudine Dardy, um, tells the story, tells the report about the inmate of a French lunatic asylum who, as she wrote, was lost one winter's day in an isolated clinic building but assured his finders that he was not cold pointing as proof to his identity card that was sitting on the radiator. <laughs> so you couldn't find um, a better illustration of the power of the document to use up the person. OK. Well, we may congratulate ourselves that the freedom-loving British people has historically resisted pressures to adopt a permanent regime of compulsory national registration and identity cards, unlike, as I've said, most of the world. Um, yet the absence, we've only, we've only had them intermittently. We've had them in the two world wars, and the most recent attempt to introduce them, of course, coincided with the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and the so-called War on Terror. And as you know, that, um, uh, that bid, which was alive between 2005 and the repeal of the law in 2010, came to nothing in the end. But the absence of identity documents in modern Britain, or identity cards, shouldn't distract us from another rather conflicting truth, which is that the English state has a long-established and in some ways a pioneering culture of gathering and recording information about its subjects and of imposing various forms of identification. So the fact we don't have an ID card doesn't mean we didn't have identification. Okay, and I'll try to explain this now. 
We would be wrong, I think, to think that only modern bureaucratic states have been interested in this kind of thing, that you've got to have you know, the complexities of the modern day, you know, an era of international travel control and immigration, blah, blah, blah. Um, and if you're inclined to think of the state as itself simply the creation of modernity, then I think you'd want to think again. I think both of those propositions can be contested. The state that we now have, okay, centralized, bureaucratic, complex, interventionist, um, that is um, largely the creation of the 19th century, the product of the 19th century. I mean, you can debate this, but that'll do. But if we think about what states do rather than what they are, then we'll recognize that England has had a state for many centuries, but it's been a local state composed of counties, boroughs, parishes, not today's central state of ministers and whatnot. It was based for a long time on quasi-judicial as well as, or perhaps even more than, bureaucratic personnel, on the local magistracy, the network of JPs, and so on, and not just the king's servants in London. These officials, these local officials, and in particular the magistrates, were accorded powers to enforce what we're justified in calling regimes of targeted individual identification in England long before the modern era. And they've been motivated by two... Um, securitizing impulses, which I think have remained remarkably stable. The security of titles to property, including our quasi-property entitlement to welfare on the one hand, that's one objective, and security against strangers and potential or actual deviants and offenders, the unknown and the unwanted, on the other hand. You could say that these two fields broadly mark the difference between our forms of identification that are honorable or enabling, on the one hand, and forms of identification that are dishonorable or stigmatizing. You could also call it, you know, more briefly, a distinction between respectable citizens, which we all are, and deviants and outsiders, which none of us are. But it's a distinction we still live with today. Let me start with the identification of the deviant or the marginal. Public security can be argued to require the identification of those who might, who might endanger it. And the maintenance of the king's peace. This is a very, very old history in, in, uh, in England. In medieval and early modern England, simply to be on the move out of your own locality was to be potentially suspect or a stranger. But it's also easy to underestimate, as I've mentioned a moment ago, the amount of mobility in earlier centuries, even if much of it was more local and more occasional than we're used to today. People from little villages in Norfolk or Devon did not go off to Ibiza or Paris for the weekend. They wanted to go to the local market town or they wanted to go to um, some other locality um, within the boundaries of England. From a surprisingly early period, or at least it surprised me when I first found um, this out, the insistence that a stranger must be able to legitimate himself meant that he had to carry, in effect, a kind of identity document. That term, legitimation, survives... I think I may get round to this in a later lecture, survives in the history of um, German identification. The historian Michael Clanchy, um, who has written a fascinating account of the transition um, in England from memory to written record, which I'll be coming back to um, in later lectures. In other words, it's an account of the transition from an oral culture to a culture based on writing. Anyway, he says that by the second half of the 13th century, as he writes, it was, quote, imprudent for anybody to wander far from his village without some form of identification in writing. This might be a letter from a bailiff or some other official testifying to his trustworthiness or explaining exactly why he was on the move. And that is, he says, from the second half of the 13th century, I mean, long before anything that we would recognise as the modern bureaucratic state had emerged in England. In subsequent centuries, ongoing efforts were made by the authorities um, in England. And I have to say the nomenclature here is difficult because the history of England is not the same as the history of, of Britain. And that, those terms are, I will be using England and Britain not exactly interchangeably, but because sometimes it's very important that we're talking about England and English law rather than some later entity which combines the different parts of the United Kingdom. But in subsequent centuries... Um, Ongoing efforts were made by the English authorities to control mobility and the petty criminality that they assumed was associated with the masterless men who were produced by England's changing economy. And, you know, change is constant, OK? So the effect on, on the labour market has always been to, um, to churn it up, to, to put people on the move. <clears throat> 
We should not forget, though, that it was also important to facilitate the mobility of those who were entitled to travel. You didn't want people necessarily to stick always in the same place. And in fact, much later on, at the time of the 19th century poor law, the whole uh, thrust and purpose of the English poor law was to get people to move, to go from areas where they were unemployed to areas, areas where they might find employment. That's really just an aside. Um, as a result, um, the forms of identification and legitimation that might have to be carried by somebody on the move in England had proliferated and become more specialised by the end of the 17th century. And I should just say here, I, you'll probably forget this, but on the written handout of this lecture that you can pick up as you leave, I misstated that. I wrote 16th century, but this, it is the 17th century, and that's important. I mean, it's important to a historian. Um, so these documents, these proliferated documents, which I've just mentioned, um, included things like apprentice passports, certificates for shipwrecked sailors and main soldiers, um, beggars' licenses, parish pauper badges, and settlement certificates, which were the certificates issued and signed by magistrates that confirmed access to the poor relief system that was based on your, your legitimate place of residence. You could get poor relief in the place that was your place of settlement, your registered, usually your place of birth, okay, or maybe your place of where you were married. Okay, and these are, these are a little later, actually. I, I couldn't find any earlier ones, but this is a, a beggar's badge. I have a feeling that this is a Scottish beggar's badge, but anyway, there you are. But that entitled you, rather like a big issue seller, let's say, who carries you know, a badge saying that he's a big, he or she is a big issue seller and that they're entitled to sell you copies of the paper. This one entitles you to beg in certain areas without being molested by the JPs and whatnot. And these are settlement papers which uh, tell, explain where somebody is settled, which is their, their, their parish of entitlement. Now, this regime of paper documents um, that were carried by the bearer or little metal badges um, in some circumstances, could be supplemented by the use of physical marks applied directly, and of course very painfully, onto the body of vagrants and offenders. Um, and these marks were intended to identify and publicise their marginal or criminal status. So, for example, an F branded on the forehead for a fugitive was instituted in 1361. A V um, 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 branded onto the breast or a hole bored in the, air, in the ear, sorry, denoted a vagrant under 16th century legislation. An R on the shoulder denoted a rogue. Um, well, I think that could be more widely used, perhaps, than it is. But, um, and actually, you know, it's interesting. I couldn't find any images of these on the internet, and I think it's because, you know, possibly, I don't know whether it's my computer um, is sort of like uh, uncertain whether, whether branding is something that you should be allowed to search on the internet. It might bring you the attention of the police. Anyway. Um, these physical stigmata, so I don't have any pictures of them, were the ultimate form of dishonourable identification. I'm going to come back to them when I um, talk about tattoos later in this series. Okay, so these identity documents or markers are not an invention of the modern state. They have a very, very distant um, uh, lineage, um, and they're associated with um, the issues of, of mobility and so on that I've talked about, but they're as much about facilitating the movement of those who are entitled to move as they are about controlling movement. Um, the other side of the um, question of uh, securitization um, is the production and protection of entitlements. And this is the um, production of legal persons, individual bearers of legal rights and obligations, and the protection of titles to property, including what I've called the quasi-property right of welfare. The story of this can again begin in, um, in, in, um, in medieval England with this long-term process, which uh, transformed uh, a culture based on orality and verbal speech um, into a culture of documents. Um, this was prompted, I think, by royal interest in investigating the, the security of property titles or the distribution of property titles and of um, legal processes, in other words, producing a record of, of laws. It penetrated very deeply into English society. And by the 13th century, again, um, written records are becoming the norm for all kinds of transactions. And this had significant implications for authenticating documents and identifying the parties and the witnesses, which I'll come back to in a couple of weeks' time. Um, I just want to very quickly um, speed up a bit here, I think. Um, I want you to, to just look at this. Uh, this is, Penn, this is, commemorates William Penn's landing in 
what we now call Pennsylvania. He proceeded to the fort and performed the livery of season. He took the key. We did deliver unto him a turf with a twig upon it, okay? A porringer with river water and soil in part of all. This denotes the handing over of a piece of land. And that physical act, um, that, that, is called, that is what livery of season is. It is about handing over something which is a physical token of the um, transaction that has just taken place. Um, and that's what would happen um, much earlier in, in, uh, in England. Um, the parties and the witnesses to a transaction of this kind would hear and see transfer through an oral declaration and a handover, um, and sometimes the youngest person present would be slapped on the ear or boxed in the face so that they would remember the event and prolong its life um, <laughs> in witness. Um, and I'll be saying more in my um, third lecture about the struggle that took place, in a sense, to convert an oral culture into a culture based on this kind of documentation. Um, and you can see survivals of this in, in the way that the poor law operated. In the 17th century, the English poor law used both um, a communal recognition based on direct face-to-face -face knowledge and also records to certify who was um, eligible for relief by virtue of their parish membership. People had to be known to the people who were part of their, their co-parishioners, so to speak, but they also increasingly were going to carry pieces of documentation, okay, which uh, increasingly became extracts from the birth register. Okay? Let me just say a little bit more about that. Um, the baptismal certificate and the birth certificate were very significant forms of, identica of identification in England. They were first introduced, parish registration, by Thomas Cromwell in the 16th century. And it was intimately connected. The whole issue of registration is about securing property rights to know what parentage is. Okay? Records of names, dates of birth um, established reliable evidence of an individual's legal personhood and so on. They were a resource for resolving disputes about property claims that were based on descent, legitimacy, um, and age. Um, and even if that was not its express purpose, that's what it did. And it's arguable that the English economy as it developed in the 17th century, was helped along by the ability of its records to help to secure uh, titles to property. Um, civil registration, which transferred this whole process of registration of, of vital statistics from the parishes to the state, to, the, to local registration offices, uh, was adopted in in England in um, 1836, again partly because of pressure about the inadequacy of the parish records to provide reliable evidence in cases of property dispute. And well before the end of the 19th century, registrar certificates of this kind were widely being used as a quasi-identity docu identity document. So nowadays we may use a driver's license or a passport. In the 19th century, it was likely to be your birth certificate that you brought along to prove your um, age, uh, if you were the applicant for a job, um, with age restrictions under the Educational Factory Act. Um, marriage and death certificates were very important as identifications in the First World War um, by, in terms of people, women who were widows wanting to claim entitlements, men who wanted to sign up for military service, and so on. The birth certificate became, in effect, the standard method of identification in this country um, in the period between the two world wars, when the, when the first welfare state was being established. In other words, this country has never had an official ID card, except in time of war and its immediate aftermath, but we've made de facto use of a whole regime of quasi-ID quasi documents, which I've been describing. Um, you could say that it's a sort of form of function creep, that these documents get used for identification, but I think it's the wrong way to look at it, wrong way around. Um, what we could see as function creep, that a document produced for one purpose gets brought into play for another purpose, that is actually the prehistory of the ID card. It's the ID card avant la lettre, if you like. It's the history of tokens and documents developed for a wide range of purposes, which we only retrospectively see as the ancestors of the contemporary identity document. Um, and that's true for almost any country that you care to name, not just um, Britain. Now, I said a moment ago that, or earlier in my lecture, that the state has not been the only driver of ID. And despite appearances, it's still not, or even increasingly, it is not the principal mover 
even behind the most recent expansions of the scope of identification. There's a private market in identification, including technologies of identification, um, which is driven by commercial providers. These are the credit cards, the consumer identities, the online verifications, and so on, and the means of access to them through all the codes and passwords that we constantly jumble up in our memories. And that motivation to relate identification to commercial security is very old. Um, I could quote you a passage from the German philosopher Fichte in the late 1790s um, when he argues that it would be very helpful if anybody who was passing um, a, a bill of exchange also had a document that proved who he was in order that the security of that bill of exchange, an early form of currency, could be referred back to should it turn out to be, a, to be problematic, could, could be referred back to the person concerned. So Fichte's argument for an identity document in the 1790s um, is not so much to control people moving around or whatever, but to, but to facilitate and secure the means of commercial relationships in Germany. Um, and if, in a sense, what Fichte is saying, we need something better than my mother's envelope, which you saw a moment ago. Um, in England... Um, Commercial fraud was a driver of attempts to, to create things like registers of well-known frauds and so on in the 19th century. When bank cards were introduced first in the 1960s, uh, there was apparently very little sense of the fraudulent purposes that they were susceptible to. It took a long time for banks to figure out that this was going to be um, a field day, that forgery was, and, and fraudulence were generated, if you like, by these new technologies. Um, but since then, since banks have recognised that problem, we've had a whole army of measures that's been drafted into service to protect the banks and their clients. Securitisation, as we all know, is becoming much more elaborate, um, especially in the new world of the internet, which I'll be coming back to in my lecture on the, uh, on the, on the, um, on the signature. And we hand over an enormous amount of information to commercial privates, pr providers, if you think about it, we, we're less wary of them, it seems, than we are of the state. I mean, perhaps because commercial providers just want to know one thing about us, you know, that I, you know, every week I buy 10 oranges at Sainsbury's or whatever. But, and, and they're not, don't have the power to control a whole a series of um, aspects of my um, activity and, and so on. Um, I think this has had, however, quite a knock-on effect on the ID card. At a trivial level, the standard... ID card is now electronic. It's now in the form which was pioneered by the credit card. Um, and it has been the case that, for example, the Indian and the German credit cards were sold to their populations. These new smart cards were sold to their populations partly with the argument that it would make um, all kinds of other areas of, of uh, social and commercial activity much more easy. With your German uh, card, you can buy certain things, you can pay certain taxes and so on and so forth. And I think it's also the case that the major companies that are um, uh, involved in the production and sale of mechanisms of, or the infrastructural technologies of ID, like Sajan Morpho in India or Gimalto in South Africa, they're now anticipating and driving the ID um, policies of states by proposing technologies and mechanisms which states have barely begun to articulate. Okay, so there's a very important commercial driver to all this and not just a political driver. Identification in that sense has become a marketable commodity in the hands of technologically energetic identity providers who are keen to sell their knowledge to whoever is willing to buy it. And in that, of course, this is what commerce does. It, it, it anticipates needs and then offers to fill them. Well, in conclusion, I hope this lecture has made it clear that identification has an intricate history. Perhaps it was too intricate for a single introductory lecture. And that's even just talking about one country, OK? But I hope it's dispelled some misconceptions about the origins of, and purposes of ID and given you an interest in discovering how these markers of identity, the name, the signature, and the distinctive sign, the distinctive mark, have come to be enrolled in the regime of ID and with what implications. Um, next week, I'm going to be looking at the origin or the status, not the origin, the status of the personal name, which is a quintessential marker of identity. Um, and I'll be looking on a wide, wider European perspective. But to introduce it, I'd like to go back to Nigel Dennis and the surreal character of Mrs. Chirk, lost in her world of nominal confusion. What is your name? The captain asks her. Surely it's written on your ration book and identity card. You see, I've doctored a ration book here. Not very effectively. This forgery would not pass muster anywhere. 
Well, the art Mrs. Chuck replies, if I knew my name, sir, I would feel more myself than I seem to feel. Now, when I'd like to know, I can't find the dratted books. The captain's response is stern. The government insists that everyone has an identity, and people who will not admit to themselves are often sent to prison. What I want to emphasize is, don't lose your name again, Mrs. Chirk. Don't at least lose the cards on which it is written. Thank you.